Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome, 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 welcome to the show. I'm loving this series. Uh, We are in a series called For the Love of Reconnecting, which has been just a real joy to imagine and develop and ultimately record and produce because it is the thing most of us are hungry for right now is this sense of reconnection, how to reconnect with ourselves, with one another, with our communities, with our culture, with our bodies, with God, like has anything ever been more disconnected than it feels right now? Um, And so we have been talking about how important it is to reconnect with people and things that fill us up with joy and purpose. And obviously one of those things is our relationship with other people. How do we stay engaged with other people who think and believe so differently than us, which has never been more apparent than it is right now? How do we heal relationships that feel broken, but are worthwhile to heal because they're with people that we love. I, I love that we are asking these important but hard questions. So today on the show, we have a thinker, a leader, a teacher who has been working in this space for a while now and can help you and I reconnect inside our relationships with other people and even with our relationship with ourselves. Um, This is the stuff that actually gives meaning to our lives. You're going to love this conversation because it is tactile. It is not just big ideas. It's not theoretical. um, It's not jargon. Um, She gets us down into the granular spaces of these are the approaches to take. These are the actual things that we do to create healing and hope inside of the lives that we are leading. So my guest today is Rosella Haiti White. She's the love big coach, a theologian, a spiritual life coach, a leadership consultant, an inspirational speaker and author focused on nurturing love that is life-giving, justice-seeking, creative, and sustaining. Okay, we're going to talk all about what that means, right? Um, Roselle is the author of Love Big, The Power of Revolutionary Relationships to Heal the World. We're going to unpack every one of those words. She's also a contributor to the brand new book, A Rhythm of Prayer, a collection of meditations for renewal, which was edited by our beloved Sarah Bessie. So Roselle is good people. Um, she is wise. She is smart. Um, she is tender. Um, she graciously talked about her own sort of spiritual deconstruction and what that looked like and where she's at now, which I think you'll find encouraging and comforting. It was to me. Um, I, I wrote a lot of things down today and I'm going to come back to this one. You guys, I'm so pleased to share my conversation with the very beautiful Rosella Haiti White. Okay. Rosella. I'm so happy to meet you. Welcome to the For the Love podcast. We're delighted to have you. Oh, thank you so much. I am delighted to be here. So it's a good day. It's a good it day. It is a good day. We were just too, we were just talking about all the people we have in common, and it's like all my best people. So yes, yes, that is it bodes well for this conversation. I'm thrilled <laughs> about it. Now I know. Um, quite a bit about you. And I've filled in my listeners a little bit. I kind of high leveled who you are. But before we start um, walking through some of your really profound work, um, can you talk a little bit more about you, a little bit about your story, what your life looks like right now, especially, you know, coming out of 2020. Um, And so that we can kind of get a better idea of who you are and where you are. Yeah. Oh, it's funny because like I have a way of talking about who I am and where I am normally and I'm using air quotes, right? Um, And 2020 has totally done away with anything that we would consider normal. Um, And so right now I am someone who is riding waves of grief, Mm. of leaning into what I call grief space, right? Mm. Space that is liminal in nature, It's the things that have happened, but we can't quite see to the other side. Um, I am someone who is recognizing that um, to create space is to honor um, the people that we love, the people that we have lost, um, and all of the feelings that that brings up. Um, My family has lost six people this year. 
Oh. Right. Or in 2020, six yeah. folks have died. Right. And so wow. I have so been sorry. on this journey. Six people. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh. And it started like February through Gosh. December. Right. That's and crushing for a family. Sorry. It's been, it's been so much. Mm. And because of this past year, because of 2020, really the only thing that I know to do is to lean into it instead of pull away from it. And I'm also someone who lives with depression, right? I'm Mm -hmm. also someone who has gone through divorce, who has experienced all of the, the D's, if you Mm -hmm. will, the despair, the depression, divorce, death, um, like so many other people, like so many of your listeners, I'm sure. Um, And I've recognized through each of those traumatic and painful experiences that the invitation is for me to lean in. So I think by way of introduction, I'm someone who leans in, Mm -hmm. right? Who does not turn or run from the feeling, who does all of the things to support herself by way of medication, by way of meditation, by way of engaging in life-giving spaces, Mm -hmm. um, but also who just creates space. Because I don't know where we thought that grief was something we could contain or control, right? Grief has its way with us and Mm -hmm. it spills up and over and out. And so I'm someone who leans in, someone who makes space. And at my core, I'm also someone who, in the words of Bell Hooks, is a love practitioner, Mm -hmm. someone who is about the practice of nurturing love and love that is life-giving and justice-seeking and ultimately sustaining. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's like where I am right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little bit about who I am. Yeah. Um, I'm also a lover of reality TV, which, you know, I don't <laughs> Thank you for including that. <laughs> I mean, let's just put it all in the mix, you know, while we're telling the truth. I, I mean, mean, you mentioned yes. it. What's your favorite? What's your favorite reality TV? So we're not, this is a judgment free zone. 100%. I don't know if it's judgment free zone, but oh, I walk sis. as if. Yes, <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> oh my gosh, I contain multitudes. Same. Right now, um, Real Housewives. I love the franchise. Which is your favorite? And so my favorite would have been prior to right now would mm. probably have been the OC because it's the oldest. I'm sure a loyalist. Is. Yeah. Um, you know, I do like New York. I was never a big fan of DC or uh-huh. Dallas, even yeah. though I'm a Texan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're Texans here. Um, But right now, Salt Lake City is bringing all the stuff. I heard that. Religious drama, cultural drama, the all the stuff. And so (laughs) when I need to disappear from all the grief or when I need to create some space to to lean into something else, uh, my reality TV. But I'll watch it all. I'll watch Ice Road Truckers. Same. Yeah. Oh, sure. I'm, um, I'm also in a grief season in a grief space with no other choice than to lean in. Cause it doesn't go anywhere. There it is. Mm-hmm. But yeah, mm-hmm. when I'm like, I just need a minute, you know, what's been there for me is the bachelor. It's oh. there for me. I mean, it shows up every single week in all <laughs> it's of its consistent. mess. It's absolute <laughs> mess. It's unredeemable. And I love yes. it. I just can't yes. get enough of it. And so yep. This is, this is a, it's a coping mechanism and I'm not sorry. And neither are you. And that's where we're at. It is what it is. So I want to talk a little bit more. you kind of touched on some of your like core values and you are a practitioner. Um, You say that you believe in people. I like, Mm -hmm. I'd like how you just say that like on its face, I believe in people. Can you talk a little bit more about why you believe in people even after (sighs) what we've seen people do and be, um, and maybe even some of those people have been ourselves when we have just, this has been such a hard season and we've not been at our best collectively and we've seen some of the worst in people. So can you talk more about that beautifully optimistic and hopeful and generous position (laughs) to take toward the world? I love all of those adjectives. Um, So here's the reality. I don't believe in what people do, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't necessarily believe in the actions that we take because we're broken and it catch us on any given day and we've seen it, we've experienced it. So I just, it's not so much about believing in actions that we take, but it's believing in this beautiful um, dream or vision that the creator 
bestowed us with that I believe in, right? So I believe that if we're created in the image of the divine, and for me, I call that God, right? I call it spirit. I call it life. For others, it might be energy. It might be any number of things. Mm -hmm. But if we believe that people are created in the image of God, right, then I don't really have a choice but to believe in people because I don't believe that God creates anything Mm -hmm. but that which is life-giving, that which is creative, that which Mm -hmm. is good and holy and not holy like, um, you know, I don't, I don't like to use the term holy, like righteous, holy, yeah. but holy, like full, right. Mm. Full of all the the goodness and love and joy, excuse me. And so when I say, I believe in people, that's what I believe in. I believe in this vision that God implanted in each of us to be, um, to be love, to be an embodied experience of connection, mm. of relationality, mm. and ultimately of justice. Now, yeah. do people always do that? Hell no. Right. Like, do I always do that? No. Right. And so I think if my my hope resided in action, then I would be much more despairing. But I'm an optimist by nature. I'm I'm a joyful person by nature. And people sometimes used to get annoyed by that. And at some point I stopped giving a, you know, I stopped caring what people thought about it. That is mm. who I am. That's who yeah. God created me to be. Mm. And so when I say I believe in people, I believe in what God has implanted in us that we didn't have to do to earn that we didn't have to do to obtain it just is because that's how gracious and giving God is. Hmm. I want to um, drill into that a little bit deeper um, because you're one of our best teachers on love um, and this sort of this way that you're explaining possibility right now um, because I, I think love is harder than it looks or sounds. Um, it, it's a strange word too. It's a word we use incredibly liberally. We kind of splash it around, you know, in meaningful ways, we love our family in random ways. We love wine. Um, we love, mm-hmm. um, our shows. So it, with a word that has become so like ubiquitous and thus sometimes stripped of its meaning, mm-hmm. um, it might do us good to, to, to drill in a little bit to what it means. And so when you talk about love, what do you mean by that word? Like what's love to you? Absolutely. And I love that you like want to drill into that because I think that one of the things that often gets missed in conversation or even in the way that we be in the world is that we're not clear about that which we're being or we're not articulating that what we mean, that Mm -hmm. which we mean. So we have various meanings, right? Talking to person A, they could mean this, B could mean that. And so for me, when I talk about love, right, I'm talking about that which is creative which is justice seeking and which is ultimately sustaining for our mind, heart, bodies, and soul. Mm -hmm. So I'm very clear about my definition for love, right? It's not about a feeling, right? It's not about um, a kind of superficial romanticized notion um, that is without struggle. No, Mm -hmm. I'm saying, you know, where love exists, and I, again, believe God is love. So where love exists, where God exists, there is creativity, there is justice and liberation, and there is sustenance Mm -hmm. um, that provides for us all. And it, it flows with abundance, Mm -hmm. right? Now, that doesn't mean that where love is, hard times or struggle or suffering isn't, it means that where love is, those things do not win. Those mm. things do not have the final say, right? So where mm. God is, suffering and strife and despair and depression does not have the final say. Mm. God is present in the midst of all of that. Love is present in the midst of all of that. And so, so much about what I do and what I hope to do in this world is to um, continue the work of people, again, like Bell Hooks, people like Cornell West, people like, you know, our contemporaries, Valerie Kaur, um, Reverend Jackie Lewis, who are about this love ethic in the world. What mm-hmm. does it mean to nurture a way of being that's steeped in love as defined by these things, creativity, justice, and sustenance, that informs our beliefs, our being, and our behavior in the world? Mm. Oh. That's a lot. Like that's, <laughs> we could just parse out every one of those and they could be their own podcast series, each and every one of them, because these are really deep waters. I wonder if we can get a little bit tactile with this. Mm-hmm. Um, you say that one of your greatest gifts is the way that you love big, which great. 
love, love, love. That's your thing. That's what you do. Um, This is what you've said about what it means to love big. You said to love big is to love despite differences, to love in the face of hardships and despair, to love ourselves and others deeply and passionately, to love in ways that change us all. Hmm. Sometimes I wish I could go back and rewrite that, especially given 2020. How do we love in the midst of all That's what I want to talk about. That's exactly what I'm, it's too late. You wrote it. Now you have to answer for it. Now you have to tell us what it looks like. So you said to love in ways that change us all. I'd like to hear what some of those ways are because you just listed a tough, those are some tough, um, that's a tough list to love despite differences. And and sometimes differences um, aren't just um, let's agree to disagree. Sometimes differences are stark and they, they carry within it the dignity of humanity or lack thereof. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. this is, this is not simple what you're saying. So could you take us into the, some of the granular work? What does it mean to love in yeah. ways like this that change us all? What does that look like? First is to recognize who they are. Second is to pray for them, like earnestly. Mm -hmm. Third is to recognize that love does not mean absence of consequence or that love does not mean absence of conflict. So for me, it then is to push back against things that this person might be doing to push back against those things that don't align with my definition of love right? Or with this definition of love and of loving big that I have written and is forever in the annals of our history, right? So um, for me to push back, where do I not see creativity or that Mm -hmm. which is Mm life-giving? Where do I not see justice or that which is liberating? Where do I not see sustenance for not just me, but for all of us, Mm -hmm. right? And to actually take a stand against those things um, with this understanding of what it is. And then honestly, fourth is to let go, right? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things Mm -hmm. that so many of us, girl, hard is not even the word, Mm -hmm. struggle with, right? Is letting go of that which we do not control. Oh my gosh. It's the only thing I'm emerging knowing for sure. Right? Like the only thing, and I I, I would sometimes say the only thing I can control is myself, but the reality is I don't control (laughs) these emotions half the time. Yeah, good point. (laughs) Good point. You know, but the only thing that I can mm-hmm. control is how I choose to show up or how yeah. I choose to respond. So I have looked at this person as if they were implanted with the image of God because I believe that they were. Yeah. I have prayed for this person, not that my will be done, but that God's um the the glory of God be revealed to them, mm-hmm. that they are able to uncover who they truly are in God's sight. I push back against where those things that are not love show up. And I also let go that which I can't control. And we can bring that to a person in our life, right? Like someone that we are in relationship with. And not for nothing, just because I'm Black doesn't mean I don't have crazy family members that I don't agree with politically or who are on the opposite side of a spectrum, right? So, you know, in my own family, what does that mean? Again, recognizing their humanity, praying for them, Mm. Speaking up when I see something that pushes back against that and letting go, Mm. right? My work, and this is how I thought about myself as a a pastoral leader, as a ministry leader, a faith leader. My work is not to convert or change anyone. Yeah, That's work that's only, if we even talk about that, that's only the spirit. That's That's only the universe, energy, God. That is not my work, Mm. right? My work is to be um, true to the gifts that I have been Mm. given my work is to to show up authentically and vulnerability is something yeah. that I was gifted with before Brene Brown made it the thing that it is today, sure. right? And, and to embody that in a way without apology, right? right? That is my work. Everything mm. else is not my mind to do. That's powerful. Really. That's really powerful. It's the way that you've presented it. It's, um, it's simple. It's not easy. It's simple, but boy, that's that would have powerful effects in our lives if we could engage the world like that with that sort of posture. Um, it's incredibly profound. Think about everything you've ever learned about getting healthy. It seems like around every five years, there's something new we're not supposed to eat. 
right? Like, what is it now? What is it? Is it fat now? Is it carbs now? What is it? Plus, every body is unique. That's why Noom uses a different approach altogether, which is psychology. Noom doesn't give you rules. There aren't rules. It teaches you how to think. So you can accomplish your personal health goals and actually stick with them long term based on who you are, where you want to go. And listen, I know everybody is busy, but Noom only takes right around 10 minutes a day to use. 10 minutes a day. You've got 10 minutes, I promise. You have heard me talk about Noom a lot and for good reason, because when I'm using Noom, I just feel better. I have more energy. Um, I feel a little bit more in control of where I'm wanting to go. I feel more calm because I know I am making the decisions I need to make to take care of myself. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com slash for the love. So that's noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash for the love. You are worth this investment in yourself. Sign up today, guys. Noom.com slash for the love. We all have memories from childhood that shaped who we are today. And with a KiwiCo subscription, you and your kid can get everything you need to create unforgettable moments shipped right to your door. Every month, KiwiCo will send your kid a super cool, hands-on science or art or geography project right to your door. And listen, KiwiCo takes exploration to new heights. Like your kid might sail the solar system. They might play pinball or even conduct some really colorful chemistry experiments. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. KiwiCo isn't just for littles. If you're kind of stressed, KiwiCo has a few crate lines just for adults where you can take a break from the world and just concentrate on making something cool with your own two hands, right? Like the olden days. You can choose the maker crate and you might put together some adorable macrame planters. Or maybe you choose the eureka crate and make an actual wooden ukulele. So cute, right? Whatever crate you choose, it's going to be 100% awesome. KiwiCo is redefining learning with hands-on projects that build confidence and creativity and critical thinking skills. There really is something for every kid or kid at heart at KiwiCo. You can get 30% off your first month, plus free shipping on any crate line with the code for the love at kiwico.com. That's a pretty good deal, guys. 30% off your first month at kiwico.com, promo code for the love. Back to our show. Uh, One of the things that you focus on in your work is this idea that you call like revolutionary relationships and the the power they have to heal the world. I'm really with you on this. I I think you've hit on something here and, um, and this is pretty vital right now. You know, I think it's pretty safe to say we are fairly disconnected right now (laughs) from each other. It's um, acute. It's an acute sense of, communal disconnection of interpersonal disconnection, um, cultural disconnection. And so uh, very, very binary right now, everybody is in their camps and in their um, silos. And um, I I think what you're talking about here is it's critical. So Mm -hmm. to you, what's, what is a revolutionary relationship and why do we need them right now in the world? No, yes. So one of the quotes that stuck with me that um, a lot of my book departed from was a quote from Mother Teresa that said that if we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten that we belong to one another. Yes. Right. If we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten that we belong to each other. Um, And that in and of itself made me really think about the power of relationship, right? So first and foremost to me, revolutionary relationships are relationships that remind us um, or that lead us to the knowledge that we in fact do belong to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's not language that we really talk a lot about, right? And I'm not talking about ownership, right? I'm talking about um, relationships that are steeped in reciprocity, Mm -hmm. in mutuality, in accountability, diversity, right? Um, These are the types of revolutionary, or these are the types of relationships that I would call those that are revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Um, Because when we're able to show up, recognizing that we are not only 
um, bound to one another, right? Our liberation is bound, yeah. our joy is bound, but also our pain and suffering are bound, mm -hmm. right? Like I can only be as well as the next person or the person that I'm in relationship with. Mm -hmm. So when we look around, we first of all, we see the disconnection, but we also see within our own lives that there are a lot of our relationships that are not well. Hmm. And when I talk about, well, I, I, so I coach women, right? One of the, what I do now is I'm a coach and I work largely with women. And when I hear stories of my clients, or even think about my own life of the fact that we're in relationships where we can't even be the fullness of who we are, hmm. right? Or we can't speak up when something is said yeah. or where we feel like we have to play small, right? Those are not what I would call revolutionary relationships, relationships that lead us into life, mm. um, relationships that invite us to, to consider um, maybe something we have not heard or right. felt or experienced before. Um, and so what my, my hope is, is that not only in my work, but in work that so many other people are doing, that people start to recognize the importance of relationships that allow each person or any person in the relationship to flourish. Mm. Because if you're not flourishing, right. you might be stagnant. Mm. And when I think about stagnation, I often think about water. And like, again, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Houstonian, I'm in Houston. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the summer, sitting water is yeah. a, a vessel for mosquitoes yeah. and for all this other stuff mm -hmm. that isn't healthy. And so you know, revolutionary relationships are also flourishing, they're mm -hmm. thriving, they're moving. And I'm not talking about moving somewhere for a goal, mm -hmm. but moving as they kind of go through life yes. and, you know, traverse the ups and downs and all arounds that life throws at us. Um, and those are the kind of relationships that I'm, I'm seeking to nur nurture and also recognize that every relationship is not that. Hmm. Um, and so when we think about our healing and that work of healing, I think those are the types of relationships that can usher in change. So let me ask you this, as I think about putting ourselves inside of revolutionary relationships, um, there are obviously to use your words from earlier, so there are some things we cannot control. We cannot control the, that other person, um, and in, in some cases, we cannot control the trappings of a particular environment. You know, there's just some places mm -hmm. where uh, relationships will not flourish. Um, yeah. They just will not. They are bound um, and kind of in bondage. And so, but when it comes to some of the practical um, approaches here, how do you and I show up inside a revolutionary relationship to help make it so? What are some of the best practices that we adopt? Yeah. What, what, is, what do we have to say if I want to be half of a revolutionary relationship, at least, mm -hmm. um, these are the sort of values and approaches I'm going to have to adopt? Yeah. So one is uh, a value and approach that's centered in self-love, right? And yeah, nurturing. I wanted to talk to you about this. Right. Nurturing our own, my own worthiness, mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I'm not someone who talks about self-love and self-care as the trappings, right? The things that we do. So I love a good massage. I love a good face sure. mask, all of those things. But when I talk about self-love, I'm talking about what does it mean to fall in love with yourself? Yes. Right. To honor yourself, to, again, do those things that bring about creativity and liberation and sustenance for yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to go back to those three things. Mm -hmm. So on the first, on the one hand, to be half of a, a relationship, a revolutionary relationship, it's to nurture self-love within, right? The second is to, to become radically honest, yes. right? To, well. to practice honesty mm. with yourself and about yourself and about or with others. Totally. Right? This like, is rare. This is rare. Like I, people are like, yeah, be honest. No, no, we are not an honest people, not no. with ourselves, not with one another. We prioritize passive aggression. We, I, I, this is hard what you're saying, saying right now, but it'll change our lives. It'll change our relationships for the better. It will change everything. Yeah. Right. Like, and, and I believe that honesty is so hard because we have bought into the lie that the highest value is to be nice. Yes, absolutely. Right? Not compassionate, not yep. empathetic, but to be nice. You're and so niceness right. actually is not a tool that will sustain, right, long-term mm -hmm. relationships. Um, and so I think we have to get radically honest, right? Who am I? What do I value? What do I need? 
what do I believe, right? Mm -hmm. And and that can lead us to, and again, talking about the markers of being in a revolutionary relationship, that leads us to some deconstruction work. Sure does. Right? Again, one of the things that I do with my clients and in the work that I do in the world is I'm unapologetic about the work of deconstruction, which is steeped in decolonizing work, to be, That's right. to be very clear. That's right. But what does it mean to basically take every part of who you are, to take apart your value system and your belief system, and to ask the question of, where did this come from, mm-hmm. right? How has this served me? Because a lot of times there are things that we do or engage in that have served us or that came out of a survival, a need for survival, sure. right? And then does this thing lead me to thrive or does this way of being lead me to be more free, right? Mm-hmm. Or to be more connected, to be more whole. And if it doesn't, we thank it and we let it go. And if it does, we keep moving. Or if we're not sure, we hold on to it as we continue to do that work, mm-hmm. right? So- so there's the self-love, there's the, the nurturing um, honesty, radical honesty, there is the engaging in the work of deconstruction. Um, and then there is the two things that I feel like sometimes get a bad rap, but gratitude and compassion. Yeah, <laughs> Which, powerful tools. I mean, so many of these things, I would be like, this is so cliche, like mm. really? Gratitude? Yes, Yeah. absolutely. I know, right? it works. It's just maddening, but it just works. It's this low tech, low hanging fruit tool that just is transformative. You're not wrong. And not so much for me. It's not about gratitude of things that are are material, because I think it's easy for us to go into the, well, I got a roof over my head. Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, you can be thankful for that. And Mm. right. Like, what does it mean to be thankful about or to notice the way that spirit is moving within you and within your relationships? Right. So I am grateful today that I, um, you know, I, I, my niece and my nephew are with me. I'm a learning coach for them in this time of COVID. And so, um, you know, I am grateful that they hear or see something that sparks yeah. like in, in curiosity. They're teenagers, you know, all about teenagers, right. But that sparks their curiosity. And that leads me to gratitude, right? Mm-hmm. I am grateful that I got a good night's sleep. Mm-hmm. I am grateful for this jug of water right here because it makes the skin do what it's doing. Right. <laughs> so like yeah. there is like the yeah. gratitude that just leads us a little bit more deeply into yeah. like this current moment and then mm-hmm. compassion and compassion for myself and compassion for others. Because the other thing that um, I recognize, and I, I feel like you've said this, I feel like Glennon has said that there's some people that say this, right? People are doing the best they can. Brene Brown says this, right? Like we are, and this goes back to believing in people. Hmm. I believe that a lot of times people are limited by their lived experiences, by where they've been, by the trauma in their lives. And so what does it look like for me to take on an orientation of both curiosity about a person and compassion? They're doing the best they can. Yeah, that's great. Um, sort of jumping off the idea of, of revolutionary relationships, you also talk about how important it is, particularly for people of faith, to put themselves in new spaces, um, in places where um, they might not be as comfortable as they're accustomed to being or prefer to be in order to love well. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like to you, maybe particularly, Mm -hmm. um, especially right now, I'd love to hear you drop that into the context that we find ourselves in where we're in a world right now where we literally cannot move around and, and physically be in new spaces the way that we have been before. How do we apply that really important concept to this moment in time? Yeah. I think every day we all have choices. We all make choices. I mean, I'm a person of faith. I believe that one of the greatest gifts God gave us was free will. I think it's maddening to God, but I think I'm grateful sure, that, that like, we, were, <laughs> we were given that. Um, yeah. And that means that we have choices. Most mm. of us have choices that we make every day. Um, and that we can tell what we value by how we spend our time and our money, right? Those are the number two or the, the top two, um, you know, things that reveal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, indicators of what we value. So uh, first question is, how do you spend your time and how do you spend your money? And do those two, the answers to those questions lead you to see a more diverse reality Mm. or is it a mono, whatever reality? That's a good grid. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. monocultural, mono experiential, whatever. Yeah. Um, so it could be little things, right? Like the next time you have to hire someone for something, who yeah. are you hiring? Are you intentional yeah. about the choice you're making, right? Um, I am very intentional that I tend to start with black women, yep. then women of color, Mm. then uh, uh, people of color (laughs) and then everyone else like that becomes my grid (laughs) like in my own little world of like how I make choices um those become the ways that I'm intentional about that um and then like as you're making choices for your family right like one of my dear friends who was a a pastor here in Houston right she made the choice that her daughter wanted to do dance okay Mm -hmm. where was she going to put her in dance Mm -hmm. right which community center which organization where was she going to be learning from? And she chose a community center that is actually not far from their community, their actual neighborhood, but that is a community um, that is focused on cross-cultural connections. Yeah. So as a dance mom, even in the time of COVID, right? Yeah. Like she is still going to be around people. Her child will be around people that are from different backgrounds. So what are the choices that you get to make every day? And how do those choices reflect um, your commitment to, and it's only Mm. a commitment to something if you're intentional about making it happen. You're right. You can't say you're committed to diversity and you haven't made any decisions that would show the diversification in your life. Um, I mean, you can say it, but you would not be aligned, right? That would be misaligned. Um, So really inviting people to consider the choices they make, where you show up. If you're going to do a book club, who are the people you invite? Are you in a book club that's led by someone who doesn't look like you? Mm. Um, You know, when you think about where you're ordering from, is it going to be a chain restaurant? Is it a restaurant that's a family, Mm. you know, restaurant that has the ability to create different food and cultural experiences? So it starts small, right? I like how you said it's not it's simple, but it's yeah. not always easy. Yeah. But again, easy and nice to me are in the same bucket. Hmm. I don't know where we got the thought, especially as people of faith, even hmm. more so as people of faith who might um, cling to the Christian narrative of yeah. who God is. Like there is nothing in scripture that screams nice or easy. That's right. I really like, I really just like everything you just said, because I think sometimes, particularly like a lot of listeners of mine who are kind of in the center of the like normative bullseye, white, Mm -hmm. you know, middle, upper middle class, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, um, hear a man, um, sort of a a charge, like, you know, let's put yourself in new spaces and under new leadership with different, with, and it feels like some big, huge initiative. Like Mm -hmm. this is a thing I'm going to, I'm not already doing it, but I'm going to, but what you are just saying is just where do you shop? Where do you go? Where do you play sports? Where do you get yep. your hair cut? Yep. This is life. It's yep. just life. Our ordinary life presents to us a million opportunities to do this work. It's just choose it or don't. Yes. Yeah. I love I, it. Our I, ordinary I, life presents extraordinary opportunities. It does. It really right. does. And I, I, you just, you just really distilled that in a way that is just, um, it's so possible. It's beyond, po- it's just a choice. It's, a, it's intention, as you've said several times. Mm-hmm. Um, this doesn't just happen accidentally. Nope. Um, I want to talk about this too with you. Something that I've been thinking about a lot. And this has been a real hellish year for me and my family in a, and everybody in the world has experienced this right now. It's just 2020 is just a complete beat down. And, um, and in our family, we just kind of went through this very like unexpected and I'm just divorced and did after 26 years, I mean, just been just a unbelievable year. Um, So one thing I'm not thinking about right now is this idea of scarcity versus abundance. Um, Mm -hmm. Because I I can speak for myself, but I think this is probably true of the greater community in general, is that a lot of us spent 2020 like with clenched fists, just trying to hold on to any shred of normalcy or happiness or what we thought was precious or treasured. and we've just been grieving. That's how you and I started this show. You yeah. said, I am grieving and me too. And a lot of us are still grieving. So I, but I wonder even inside that really tender truth. And I thank you for speaking it right out of the gate. Um, 
I wonder if it might be possible even here, even now, if you think we can begin shifting from sort of a scarcity mindset, clenched, closed, afraid, um, to begin opening back up to, to even just to develop eyes, to see abundance again. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then what that might do for our relationships. I'd like to just hear you speak into that. What, what wisdom do you have to offer us as we turn into 2021 and just say, I wonder if we can open our hands again. Yeah. I breathe because I am mindful of a few things, Mm. right? One, um, loss and grief are, um, they they don't care, right? Who you are, where you are, what you look like, what your bank account is. It it doesn't, um, they don't care. Mm. And I also believe firmly that where we are currently, we may never have been before, Mm. but two things are true. Some of us have felt these feelings before, maybe not in this exact arrangement. Sure. And we are a part of a larger story in humanity, in history, that has been through before. That's right. And has probably been through things that we've been through Mm -hmm. or things we couldn't even comprehend. Mm -hmm. So for me, right, the way that I'm able to lean into abundance, because scarcity is something I struggle with as well, Mm. right? And it's actually an inner thing for me, like, I am not enough. That's where my Mm. scarcity lie comes from, right? Not so much that there isn't enough, but I'm not enough. Totally. Um, And this, listen, Mm. and it's been, I'll be 40 this 2021. And I'm like, we ready to get rid of that. Yes. Bye. (laughs) Right. Um, Enough. Enough. Right. I am enough. I'm more than enough. Um, but there is some wisdom that is, is in our ancestral lineage, hmm. that's in our faith lineage, right. right? That's in our collective consciousness. So I think the way that we move from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset or lean into abundance is to first recognize that we're not in this alone. And when I talk about decolonizing, I feel like this is the biggest lie that whiteness as, and I'm using my air quotes again, listeners, that whiteness and white supremacy, or in the words of Resma Manikin, white body supremacy has taught us Mm. that you are an island unto yourself, right? right? Um, So the first thing is to recognize that we're not alone, Mm. right? In this collective experience and in our own lives, there are people that we can journey with that want to journey with us. Um, and even writ large, right? We're journeying through this wilderness together. The second thing is to notice and to pay attention and learn, if you maybe don't know, what the history of your people has been, mm. especially history when it relates to suffering and strife and pain and trauma and grief. Mm. What are the stories? What are the things that your people have gone through? What are the things that they've overcome? Because that starts to then ignite your imagination to recognize that, yes, this is a struggle and yes, there is pain and you are from a people that got through it. That's good. Now we all have different stories, right? My story happens to be one that is connected to the history of slavery in this country. And so I can actually say that one, my grandmother who just died in May, right? She dropped out of school in third grade was a granddaughter of sharecroppers, went on to have seven children and lived a life that I'm literally named for. Her name was Rosella, right? Mm -hmm. I'm Rosella. So my grandmother came through all of that. She buried three of her four sons before they were 25 years of age. Wow. Like not, it's not a comparison. It's Mm -hmm. the recognition Mm -hmm. that there is strength that flows through my veins and that I can find right within Mm -hmm. my community. So there is the personal ancestry and then there's the faith lineage. I mean, I I really don't want to be a church nerd. Like I left the church. I was like working in a church, working for the Bishop, working in the national office. I walked away from it all in 2016. Like I really don't want to be a church person. But I'm a God person. And when I think about the stories of our faith, 
Mm. You talk about people that were wandering in the wilderness and wondering what God was up to, who were disconnected from themselves and from each other. And time and time again, we see God showing up and providing in the midst of the struggle. Mm -hmm. And I'm not someone who believes that God causes struggle. I don't believe that. Um, You know, I I, I don't believe it. I kind of reject it wholeheartedly. But I do believe that God sustains us Mm-hmm. that God liberates us and that God is constantly pointing us towards life in the midst of everything we go through. Mm-hmm. So for me to move from scarcity to abundance is to, to begin to investigate your story, mm-hmm. to look around you and connect with those in your, your space or in your virtual space, in your circle. I've connected more with some people in this season than I had before, even though we could see each other just because we just need to touch base and talk Mm. and connect. Um, And is to trust. I mean, part of this is trusting, right? That which we don't see. Um, The last thing I'll say about this, I love Valerie Mm. Kaur. Like I am, I'm a huge fan of her work and her presence in the world. Mm. Um, Her book, See No Stranger just was just released recently. But in her TED Talk, she talks about what if what we're experiencing is the darkness of the womb and not the darkness of the tomb, right? What if we are waiting for our future yet to be born? And that has stuck with me as I think about grief, like, and all of this, because Mm. on the one hand, darkness is a whole other thing we can unpack later (laughs) about how we talk about darkness and light. But on another hand, as someone who lives with depression, I understand darkness. I understand what it's like to to not be able to find your footing, right? Because Mm. darkness disorients, or we could say it reorients, Mm. right? Darkness provides space for us to see the light. It provides the nurturing needed for that which is fragile to emerge. Mm. And so when I think about grief writ large, I started to reframe how I understand it as less about endings and death, though death happens, death occurs, and an invitation to what could be. Mm. Um, And I don't say that. I always, I think my Mm. only fear sometimes when I talk about this is I don't want people to think that I don't like grieve and cry and spend days in bed, but that's part of the space, right? I create space for that. Mm. No, I don't, I can't do nothing. This week is a, it's a wrap. Like I'm going to be crying and snot is dripping. And I got on either the bad TV or no, nothing in the dark, you know, because I do believe that grief is holy and lament as a practice Mm. is something that we have gotten further and further from. So my hope is that people lean into that Mm. because I think it's waiting for us. It it wants to meet us. It wants Mm. to, to show us, you know, if grief is the price that we pay for love, right? Like Mm. we grieve because we love. That's right. Mm. I wonder if you would be willing to talk for just a minute. You just, you touched on it just for a second. Um, I have a lot of, of women in my community who um, are going to be like me in that the way that you are talking about God and spirit and the history of just people of faith and the whole world. And it's uh, moving to me and I'm drawn to that. And and I'm telling you that they would have also deeply picked on, uh, picked up on, um, but I kind of walked from the church. Um, because that is a complicated space a lot of us find ourselves in Absolutely. where um, it's rather it's how we were raised or whatever the thing is it's really hard to parse out mm-hmm. organized religion from spirit um, I, I did not prepare you that I was going to ask you this but I, I wonder if you would be willing to sort of talk just a little bit about what that looked like for you yeah. and where you were, where you came to and where you are now. Yeah. So where I was, was a uh, entrenched church nerd. I mean, yeah. I grew up in the yeah. church and it was the Lutheran church on my mom's side. My dad's side was much more um, the holiness Pentecostal and then oh, sure. into Baptist later. But my upbringing was largely in the Lutheran church. I mean, acolyte, 
church youth group leader, um, church camp. I worked at camp for three summers. I was on the board for my camp, right? Like went to seminary, married in the church, confirmed in the church, divorced in the church, like all of that, Um, you know, worked in the highest office of our church, if Mm. you will. And I think the disconnection started or the, I called it a dissonance started when I had been doing the work of really getting clear about my values and my beliefs. And I would say writ large, my particular church structure is fairly aligned with my beliefs. I was a part of a progressive denomination, Mm -hmm. progressive beliefs. And yet when it came to issues of race, Mm. when it came to issues Mm -hmm. of class, and when it came to being bold in our witness about those things, my church, struggled and dropped the ball and failed multiple times. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was in the place where I could not understand how this, this institution, which for me was wholly aligned with my faith, Mm -hmm. right. Could be, could miss the mark. Like, like what is happening? And it led to me leaving um, Mm -hmm. after it was after the Charleston, the Emanuel Nine, um, mm-hmm. I did a blog post that got a lot of traction yeah. around us raising white Lutheran young adults, because I was the director of, of, of mm-hmm. young adult ministry for my denomination, who would then go and shoot the very same people we want to be in community with. Wow. And um, mm-hmm. Reverend Clementa Pinckney had gone to the Lutheran Seminary in South Carolina, mm-hmm. right? So this was one of those moments. And I had talked about Trayvon. I had talked sure. about Mike Brown. I had yeah. talked about all of those people before and wanting the church to just name the sin yes. of white supremacy and the church couldn't do it. Mm. Um, and, and it was a, an equal struggle for me too, because it was not only my church of my upbringing, but now it was the church that I worked for. Right. So like yeah. that space of having to, or critiquing something that I felt like was mine, of course, because I was a part of it, but also now being paid, right. Totally. By the same thing. So I had to make some decisions. I had to, to do some deep work. And yeah. it was actually in my condo in Chicago on Lake Michigan, watching Beyonce's Lemonade about her grief and uncovering. I wow. had my glass of wine and I'm sitting there crying. Wow. of like hmm. her journey of unbecoming, my yeah. journey of unbecoming, this like cognitive dissonance that I feel, yeah. this thing that I'm now naming for the first time. And I talked to my dad and he was like, baby, you can always come home. Hmm. Like, you you can walk away from it because everyone's like you got a good job you're doing this thing and it's like that's profound that your dad said that really profound come home i mean literally Mm. i like gave my three months notice i finished out that summer and i moved back into my parents house right at 36 years old yeah i've been married and divorced i've I've done this before right like i've done the and i'm recognizing or i recognize in that moment that the first thing that came up was anger Mm. right Right. I was so f- mad right. that this thing that I committed my life and my livelihood to, right, was was not able. Totally. And then I was um, I experienced a profound sense of conviction oh. because I had placed mm. the church in a place and in a space that is only ever reserved for Jesus. Yeah, I hear you for God. For yeah. divine. Now we recognize mm-hmm. that that space is a conduit and sure. a connection for most. I mean, my community, my family, all of that. And yet, yeah. I had placed this entity, this human-made institution, right. in a space that is only ever reserved for Jesus. Wow. And so I was both mad, and then this goes back to where we started, Jen. Like, I believe in people. Mm. I can't believe always the actions of people. Yeah. So do I believe and have hope in the church? Yeah. Mm. Do I trust all the actions of it? No. Right. And have I come to a place now where I am very clear that the things that are the markers of my faith are actually grounded, not in institution, but in yeah. this that. profoundly mysterious, ridiculously mm. hard to understand relationship mm. with God? Like that's where it resides now. That's it. That's the difference. Like, get down to the root of the thing, and where is it? Where it's, where is it located? Is it in mysterious spirit, God, Jesus, or is it in organized religion? 
Um, yes. uh, thank you for walking through that a little bit. I um, lead a community who largely is in that space one way or another, they're creeping up on it. They're in the middle of it or they're on the other side of it. And yep. it is, um, it's disorienting. Yeah. It's disorienting, especially for those of us. And I'm just like you, I mean, I was like born and bred right up under the steeples. Mm -hmm. And so it, it facing what ultimately feels like a bit of complicity inside the structures. I was also a lifer staffer. Yes. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's a complex m matrix of emotions to go through. And so thank you for walking us through. I I'm so, um, it's precious to me. It's like tender to me mm -hmm. to hear you have walked through that, come through on this other side and have this very genuine and sincere, clearly and obviously like love for things of the spirit and yes. what yes. it looks like in real life in a human heart inside complicated relationships outside of man-made structures. Like that's so precious to bear witness to mm -hmm. um, and to sit under leadership like yours that has been tested and tried and, um, and now emerges like beautiful and pure. I'm, I, I will not forget that. Thank you for being willing to talk about that. Okay, life is just too short to wear uncomfortable bras. It just is, all right? And let me tell you, I've never had a bra I loved more than third love bras. Never. I have a drawer full of them now because they are literally the most comfortable bra I've ever owned. You've heard me talk about their Fit Finder quiz, but now third love just launched the fitting room quiz. So this new and updated quiz focuses on size, breast shape, current fit issues, and your personal style so that you can easily find bras and underwear that are literally perfect for you. And throughout the whole thing, Third Love has fit stylists who are available for one-on-one -on -one chats to answer any question you have. Guys, this is way better than a traditional bra fitting experience because, excuse me, you get to do this from the comfort and convenience of your own home. There is nothing better than that. Oh, and get this. Third Love has a brand new bra collection that I absolutely love called Ombre Mesh. These bras are gorgeous and have kind of a vintage throwback look with silky layered mesh, but with this very like luxurious modern feel. Go check them out. They're gorgeous. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering my listeners 20% off your first order. Yay. Good deal. Go to thirdlove.com slash for the love to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. Yay, yay, yay. So that's thirdlove.com slash for the love for 20% off today. Okay, back to our show. Let's wrap this up. You got a life. <laughs> you got a life. You got stuff to do today. <laughs> okay. You know, this series in the, sh in the show is just about reconnection in general, reconnecting with ourselves, reconnecting with God, reconnecting with one another, um, reconnecting in our bodies. I, we're very disembodied people. Yes. Um, if we ever connected in the first place, I, would, none, I wasn't taught that. But um, so in, in, the, in the theme of, of connection, what, sh what we're asking everybody in the series, these questions. Mm -hmm. So just whatever comes to you. Um, what is your personal favorite way to, let's just pretend it's not COVID right now. Okay. We've never heard of it and we're living uh, the life we're used to living. What's your favorite way to connect with other people? Like your go-to, like, this is what we're doing rally. Brunch. <laughs> Brunch with One bottomless mimosas values. or oh, sangria, yeah. Yeah. good food, an outdoor <laughs> patio. No mosquitoes, so it's not in Houston, but no. you know, somewhere. Uh, brunch. Uh, and that, that just goes with maybe some live music in the background and laughter. Just storytelling, eating, brunch. Mm -hmm. You have just said one of my very favorite things. <laughs> one of my very, very favorite things. Um, I remember saying a couple of years ago, I'm like, I kind of like want to just, I want to stop being a church girl. Like you said earlier, I want to stop being a church girl. And my reason is not noble. My reason is because I want to go to Sunday brunch. Yes. That's why 
I want to go to Sunday brunch. It's funny you said that. There was a season when I was a hospital chaplain and I wasn't working in a congregation. So that meant that my Sundays all of a sudden became freer. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, like this is where people are on Sundays. They're not (laughs) at church. They're at brunch. (laughs) They're having way more fun. (laughs) Okay. I love that answer. That was the perfect answer. Okay. How about this? Um, For you, um, let's just say it's even in the middle of the day sometimes and you feel that tightness, you know, that your chest starts to Mm. close, the feelings creep in. And I appreciate you speaking so candidly about depression too. What do you reach for generally? Maybe it's one or two things where you just, um, what do you do to reconnect with yourself, to get back inside Mm. your body, um, to, to pull you through that moment? So I meditate. Um, yeah, meditation has been a big piece of my ongoing wellness and yeah. healing journey. I meditate, set the timer for 10 minutes. I have a meditation mm-hmm. playlist. I breathe mm-hmm. and that's it. Oh, um, a good friend of mine put meditation in my hands about five months ago and it's, um, it's changed some things for me. Mm-hmm. So it's a powerful practice and, mm-hmm. um, it has given me sleep. Um, it has given me, it's a, give, give me a place to grieve. It uh, opens up a chamber that I can't explain, but it does. Finally, last question. This is Barbara Brown Taylor's question and answer it however you want. What's saving your life right now? My family, you know, I'd want to say sex, but that's not, that's been <laughs> Not here, because that would normally say not. But right it's now, been not here. <laughs> um, but my family, oh. you know, like I, yeah. my niece and nephew. Like I said, I, I started um, doing their. I was their learning coach because we moved into virtual school. Yeah. Um, my brother, their dad, my my parents who are hysterical. My roommate, you know, I mean, my, and that includes my family of choice. Sure. Um, they they just they keep the joy going. And I love looking at the world through teens. I mean, they're like (laughs) silly. They don't think I have to repeat myself all the time. And they say stuff that's profound. Like it's like all of that at once. And so it just, you know, and every now and then it's a mess all in the same 10 minutes. It's a mess. Uh And every now and then if it's too much and like the meditation didn't work, I say, okay, we're going to watch a movie middle of the day. What we got. (laughs) And that just makes it. Yes, absolutely. We have to reach for the lesser tools sometimes. Sometimes yep. are the only thing that fill in the gap. Um, oh, I'm so, I loved this conversation with you. Mm-hmm. Can you tell my listeners before I let you go where they can find you, what your book is, where, where they can find your work, everything, yes. all that. Yeah. So my book is Love Big, The Power of Revolutionary Relationships to Heal the World. It's available wherever books are sold. People always ask, like, and I'm sure you get this question, well, how do, well, maybe you don't get this question because you're in another stratosphere, but like, how do we buy it so that you get, and I'm like, it doesn't actually matter anymore, but support your local independent bookstores. Love it. That's like, please too. do that. Yeah. Um, and so that you can find the book wherever I am online at Love Big coach on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at love big coach. And my website is rosella Um, I'm a coach, right? I am someone who wants to nurture life giving and justice seeking love of ourselves and of others. I have a racial healing and wellness coaching program that's launching that's just for white women. Um, wow. I've got a bunch of other goodies that are unfolding right now around coaching and around meaning making and around grief and living a life that aligns with your deepest values beliefs and hopes mm. and so that's me look at you look at you go <laughs> look at you go this is your year turn Girl, 40 i'm You're like putting your work into the world <laughs> yes welcome to your 40s you're gonna love it here thank you uh, you're thank gonna you. love it here we've earned our stripes <laughs> by the I time we hit our 40s Oh, delighted to have you. Thank you so much for your beautiful work in the world, for being such a good and a faithful leader and a teacher and a coach and for living out your values, for being a person of integrity. Nothing means more to me than people who live their word. And so watching you do that um, with such profound faithfulness is amazing. Um, Just a joy to have you. Thank you. Thanks for being on today. Thank you. Okay, everybody, Uh, we will put 
all the links to Rosella's work that she just mentioned over at jenhatmaker.com underneath the podcast tab. This will be the most recent episode. So you can go there, get show notes, all the links, all her stuff, all her books. It's a one-stop shop um, for you to begin to follow Rosella everywhere she's at and be more acquainted with her work. Some of you guys um, might just be in a space here at the beginning of the year where you are ready for her coaching. Um, she, this might be somebody that you hire, um, that you sit under her leadership. Uh, I know a lot of us are deeply considering ways to make 2021 life-giving. And so we will have that all for you. I'm so grateful to her for being on the show today and bringing her special work to bear on our community and also on the world at large. And so I'm um, so glad to have you here guys, 2021 on the podcast. We're so thankful for you, for this space, for this community, um, for the 30 million downloads this show has seen. That's you just downloading it one by one by one. Um, the greatest listening community, Laura and Amanda, and Abby and I, we are so grateful to serve you, to dream up conversations for you. They're going to mean something um, to invite guests that you love, that you want to hear from, that we want to learn from together. And so thank you for rating. Thank you for reviewing. And definitely thank you for subscribing to the podcast. Keep at it guys. All right. See you next week.